Uh, fuck the BBC. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's basically that simple, but, you know, this is a, this is a, a, a long vlog, so I need to say more than that. Uh, but basically, fuck the BBC, exactly. Um, and that's basically all I need to say. Um, <laughs> today's reason for me doing that, which, by the way, feel free to like and subscribe and share and shit, because uh, when you cuss in the first minute of your video, YouTube suppresses it. Um, and I do that a lot, because I'm not going to censor myself for a CIA-supported outlet like Google. Um, <laughs> and, and because they, they work their monetization as the same engine that, like, controls whether or not your content is seen. So that's fucking fun. Um, the general subject here, uh, is, is something, like, I have to do this. I have to relate everything to fucking Sonic, because it all works. And literally, fuck everybody who, uh, says that I'm somehow wrong for this, or who mocks me, because it works. Um, let me be very direct and clear about the initial intent of this video. Uh, I started with this thinking, oh, I'll just rant about this dumb article they wrote for, <laughs> for a bit, but you know what? I'm gonna do more. I'm gonna do more than that, because fuck the BBC. Um... The BBC, I, I wrote this on Twitter, the BBC is suggesting that Sonic the Hedgehog should be retired because the character was created too long ago. Good thing Sonic is all about not giving a fuck what the government thinks, much less their propaganda. Wonder why they singled him out. Could be because he's a freedom fighter. I also wrote... And no, I'm not kidding, they seriously wrote this piece of shit, and I linked the piece of shit. I said, as far as I've seen, nobody is saying, hey, maybe Mickey Mouse should kick rocks. Nobody's crying that Looney Tunes is still up, doc. Nobody else gets targeted by the literal government but Sonic. This is why the franchise is great. It pisses off all the right people. It really does. I have people in my mentions regularly upset about me talking about Sonic, and they're exactly the kind of people who I don't mind upsetting. Um, the and and the the franchise is constantly catching flack from people who have you know other bad opinions. Um, let me read this article. It's really fucking bad. Uh, this was paid for by Britain's taxpayer money, tax victim money as I like to put it. This was paid for by theft. Um, <laughs> that, let, me, let me fucking elucidate you here. From News Round. This is news, guys. This is news. It's not even listed opinion. It's just called news. New Sonic game. Should video games keep using old characters? This is 30th of May. Last updated 0028. <laughs> One of gaming's most iconic characters is coming back for the next generation of consoles. Sonic the Hedgehog will return in a brand new game coming out next year. Sega released a teaser trailer on Thursday that showed just a glimpse of the super fast blue hedgehog running through a forest, leaving a trail of digital effects and a weird path behind him. The numbers, 2022, then appeared on the screen. The game will be released on PS4, PS5, Xbox One, Xbox Series, Series X, and Nintendo Switch, and PC. In an official announcement, Sega seemingly revealed that Sonic Rangers is the name of the new game. However, the company later said that information was outdated. They then included this, like, worried picture of Sonic for zero fucking reason. Uh, with a subtitle, The popular gaming character has recently starred in his own film. Yeah, the popular character has recently starred in his own film. Yeah, Sega should totally stop making Sonic because you say they should in the title or whatever. The, and, and, and this is the thing. It keeps on just sucking the dick of this franchise for a bit, right? 
It's just one of several Sonic games that will be released soon. A remake of the popular Sonic Colors called Sonic Colors Ultimate will be coming to the PS4, XB1, Nintendo Switch in in September. Sega says the new version will feature stunning visuals, additional features, a new mode, and improved gameplay enhancements. The original Sonic games, which have been re-released several times since the first game came out 30 years, will also be available to play as a new title called Sonic Origins. Um... (laughs) The first Sonic game released in 91 for the Sega Genesis was developed after Sega wanted a character to compete with Nintendo's mascot Mario. Sonic's success helped Sega become one of the leading video game companies during the 1990s. That success has generally continued, with the the famous Blue Hedgehog recently appearing in his own 2020 movie, Sonic the Hedgehog, with a sequel planned for release next year. There's also a new animated Netflix series, Sonic Prime, coming soon too. Are you starting to see a theme here? Like, maybe they just wanted an excuse to draw people into the article by the clickbait title, and it's not actually about that. Uh, Because all of this is something you could learn from Wikipedia. All this is something you could learn from reading people actually announcing the new game without asking this dumb fuck question in the title. Then they get to the real meat of the articles, which is really just a tiny little scrap in the end. However, newer Sonic games such as Sonic Forces have been criticized by reviewers and gamers, unhappy that the gameplay was boring, forgettable, and didn't have a good (laughs) storyline. Are you excited for the new Sonic games, or would you prefer a new character for the new generation of consoles? Vote below, or have your say in the comments. That's it, that's the article. That's fucking all. British citizens were stolen from by the by 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 the fucking boot of the law to pay for this piece of shit this news which is not really news let that sink in if you're a briton you should be fucking roiling about this you know this person this 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 journalist for this news outlet they don't even list who it was it looks like they just fucking <laughs> <laughs> they just fucking pumped it out. They don't list the author because they don't want the author of this piece of shit to catch flack. They just want to pump this piece of shit out and have people fucking lick it up. Well, they have a poll. I obviously voted that, you know, <laughs> yes, they should. Because it's a good franchise and because he's a freedom fighter. He supports liberty. He opposes taxation generally. Um, the, the whole point of the franchise has always been to oppose tyranny and like, especially fascism and the kind of thing that would lead to piece of shit posts like this. So no wonder the BBC doesn't like the Sonic franchise. No wonder BBC fucking singled the Sonic franchise out, you know, and, and a lot of people, when I brought this up, brought up. The fact that, like, they're not fucking paying attention to new shit. They're not trying to make new properties. I'm looking at this right now. They've got, like, Almost Royal, where they talk about some of the oldest characters in the book. Literal royalty. Um, Animal babies. So many fucking animal things. Just, you know, like, 18,000 documentaries jerking off Richard Attenborough for a bit. Uh, Broadchurch, they've been going through that forever. Uh, a show that seems to be uh, exploiting crippled people for views. Um, Doctor Who, which has been around since the 60s. Fucking Doctor Who, Doctor Who Revolution of the Daleks or whatever it is. Um, you know, fucking Torchwood. All parts of the same 1960s property, which is fully like 30 years older than Sonic. And they're not talking about canceling that. They're not talking about a new character for a new generation of TV shows. <laughs> Top Gear is still clicking along. Uh, fucking <laughs> Star Trek. You can watch Star Trek through the BBC. Like, what? What? How is this real? How is this a real story that they really have really going through here? How is this paid for by taxation? Well, because 
the BBC are a bunch of hacks who regularly take money from governments to peddle their fucking viewpoints. And I'm not joking. Um, when it comes to the BBC, they're obviously, they obviously have like uh, an obligation to the, the uh, government that funds them. That is the British government. And that's what you think. You know, you think British Broadcasting Corporation. You think the Brits are funding this, right? And you're right. The Brits are funding that. The Brits are running that. Except when they aren't. And except uh, when it's not part of a greater sort of conspiracy against reality. Now, what do I mean by that? And, and how am I going to make a thing where I started by talking about Sonic the fucking Hedgehog about anti-government shit yet again? Well, let's talk about the BBC for just a second. Um, <laughs> and let's talk about this article on Al Jazeera um, about how the BBC did fake news in the past. Um, and <laughs> the, the article goes into what I have. This is by um, uh, Hamid Dabashi. And uh, it's when the BBC did fake news in its attempt to dissect the global disinformation e epidemic. The BBC handily forgets its own history of fake news. Uh, what I have in mind is, of course, the harmful role of the BBC as the propaganda machine of British imperialism around the globe. And as well as in enabling and facilitating the CIA and MI6 coups of 1953 in my homeland in particular by doing precisely what it now goes around finding darker nations doing, indulging in fake news and propaganda. The role of the BBC in the overthrow of Mossadegh was not out of character or unusual. In a piece titled Why the Taboo Tale of the BBC's Wartime Propaganda Battle Must Be Told, published by The Guardian, David Boyle writes about characters like Noel Francis Newsom, who, as director of European broadcasts, led what is still the biggest broadcasting operation ever mounted in 25 different languages for a total of just over 25 hours a day across three wavelengths. Such pieces of truth are sources of embarrassments for the BBC today, for it was he who set up the strategy to use news as a weapon of war. It had, not, it, it had to not just be true, but also recognizably British. Here we learn it was Newsom and Ritchie, his deputy Douglas Ritchie, who really created the myth of the BBC by using news as a weapon, not quite what the myth suggests, with all the resources of culture and music and humor. If you think this too suspicious, then you ought to know. Hitler's propaganda chief, Goebbels, warned in 1944, there is one way in which the British, despite the narrowness of their political thinking, are ahead of us. They know that news can be a weapon and are experts in its strategy. This is not a, any browner black person talking. These are white Germans talking about white British leading the BBC. Uh, BBC and the CIA MI6 coup of 1953. Read that section if you want. Because basically, uh, it goes over the fact that, like, <laughs> BBC Radio 4 finally admitted in a program called Document and subtitled A Very British Coup, the fact of this treacherous act of the BBC. Documents reveal BBC now admitted the true extent of Britain's involvement in the coup of 1953, which toppled Iran's democratically elected government and replaced it with the tyranny of the Shah. Read it! Okay, read that article. Um, then, and it'll be in the description, by the way. Then, check out this article um, by the, the, the Hill about how the UK government secretly funded Reuters in the 1960s and 70s. That will also be in the description. Then, check out this article on the Grey Zone about how Reuters, BBC, and Bellingcat participated in covert UK foreign office-funded programs to weaken Russia, leaked docs reveal. Read that, because it's fucking insane. Um, then, I, I invite you after that, after all of that, to read this article uh, from the uh, War Museum and, and read this article and then tell me that uh, the BBC is an entity 
one should trust because it's a PDF document uh, and it goes into the relationship between the CIA uh, translating documents for the BBC um, led to a huge amount of information consolidation and saving time and money. Um, so let, let me let me read this excerpt here. As Jeffrey Richelson, an American University academic specializing in CIA history, observed, post-Second World War cooperation between the BBC Monitoring Service and the United States was formalized in 1947 as a result of an exchange of letters between the head of the Foreign Broadcast Information Service of the CIA's Office of Operations and the head of the BBC Monitoring Service. The basic provisions were noted in a 1950 document, the two-page FBIS-BBC Reciprocal Agreement Basic Provisions. The agreement divided the monitoring tasks among the small number of stations then operating, provided for FBIS personnel to be stationed at BBC headquarters to select material, and required FBIS to provide material to satisfy BBC requirements. It also provided for a joint FBIS-BBC Monitoring Service Committee. End quote. Nevertheless, the close relationship between the CIA and BBC has not always been acknowledged. In a 1980 interview with the New Statesman, the then di uh, director of BBC Monitoring, John Ray, said in an answer to a question uh, about FBIS's connection to CIA, I've heard they're part of the CIA. I'm not curious about it. If Ray was not being disingenuous, he must have forgotten the clear admission of the BBC CIA link in the BBC Annual Report, 1948 to 1949. Quote, there is a close cooperation between the BBC's monitoring service and its American counterpart, the Foreign Broadcast Information Service of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, and each of the two services maintained liaison units at each other's stations for the purposes of a full exchange of information. End quote. The diplomatic exchanges themselves, and certainly the rather large secondary literature of which the Richelson citation above is but one instance, repeatedly make reference to the U.S. and Great Britain dividing the world for the purposes of monitoring efficiently the world's open source communications and publications. In spite of that, there is in fact some overlap and some differences between FBIS, and then it goes into some of the discrepancies you might see between the CIA's interpretation and the rest of the world's. But basically, that tells you everything you need to fucking know. The BBC has a long history of working with basically any government who's willing to help them craft a pro-government narrative. They're never on the side of the people, um, and in the end run of it, they rely on the perpetuation of the state in order to continue their funding model. That means that this article, this piece of shit article about Sonic, um, this, this article trying to tear down one of the biggest fictional freedom fighters ever, um, it makes total sense. Because, of course, they would want to censor this particular character. He stands in the way of everything they stand for, everything they're supported by, everything they need to survive. And that is why you should continue to support the franchise by feeling free to support the remaster of Sonic Colors, the TV show, the movies, and the new game. Because clearly, it pisses off the powers that should not be that such a popular gaming icon can be so anathema to everything they want you to be. Just like he always was, a nice, big, fat, fuck you rebellion to the people who should not have power. So, with that being said, um, this was brought to you by Opsec Drip. Feel free to check that out. Uh, 60 second news bites from a libertarian perspective and all of that and more in a 240 pixel glorious Shamog laden package. Feel free to subscribe to mine as well. This has been Jeremiah Rants with an open window. Out.